Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to uh, 130B, quantum mechanics. Uh, so today we are going to continue our discussion of uh, particles in continuous space. So last time we have switched uh, to part two, which uh, we basically switch from describing quantum mechanics in discrete systems to continuous systems where the quantum state, uh, you can still think of it as kind of like a vector, but it is a vector not labeled by integer indices instead of labeled by a wave function. Or it's a comb linear combination of a continuous set, continuous set of bases, so the, con uh, uh, so the combination coefficient, instead of like a bunch of numbers, it becomes a wave function. So that's the idea of introducing wave function. Uh, to describe particles in a continuous space. And this, uh, this state uh, x, uh, for example, in our case, can be considered as uh, the state corresponding to a single particle in a one-dimensional space at position x. So given that, uh, <clears throat> we continue to uh, introduce two operators which are very important. One is the position operator. Position operator is uh, defined to be the Hermitian operator of which uh, this uh, x, uh, X state, the, the position eigenstate is the eigenstate of the position operator. It's basically defined that way. So by saying that, that means uh, when you apply the position operator on the position eigenstate, what happens is that this eigenstate only gets scaled by a factor, and that factor is the eigenvalue which corresponds to the position, uh, which is a real number. So that's the definition of position operator. And in order to write down the position operator, there are two different ways. One is to express the position operator in this bracket notation uh, as an eigen operator uh, on this eigen basis. You can see it's a diagonal operator. <clears throat> Another way of writing it down is, uh, is basically this representation down there. So because uh, in quantum mechanics, every operator should be written as a, uh, as a linear combination of this bracket notation as a, as a basis operators, right? So this is uh, kind of like the definition of the position operator. But maybe you will say, OK, as an operator, what it does is basically to take a state in and then give you a new state, right? But now the state is described by the wave function. So just tell me, uh, what, the, what does it do when you apply a position operator on the wave function? So don't talk about this abstract nonsense. If you want to know what wave function changes under this operation, and this is the expression. The, what, what happens to the wave function is that when you apply the position operator to a state, the state wave function just gets multiplied by, uh, by, by x, by the position, basically. But the reason that we uh, are very careful in, in applying this formula, because we need to understand that this formula ha has already assumed a basis choice that we are representing our wave function in the position eigenbasis. And only in that basis, uh, the position operator acts in this way. For example, if you're, you consider wave function, if you, it's the same state, but written in the momentum basis, there's a new wave function, maybe call it phi, and then with the momentum eigenstate, you can also write uh, states like that. Then, then this uh, uh, x operator acting on this momentum eigenstate, basically, uh, uh, momentum wave function basically looks like a differential operator. So it can be very different from uh, what is written there. But, uh, but, the, but this formula provides a universal definition, and this is like a representation in the, in the position basis. <clears throat> OK, so after defining the position operator, we continue to talk about momentum. And then momentum was a rather more abstract concept, uh, but, but it's related to translation. So in quantum mechanics, regardless how we define momentum in classical physics, in quantum mechanics, it's defined to be the generator of uh, translation. So translation is a unitary operation that, uh, that basically translates your state uh, in the space. And then, uh, <clears throat> And then it's unitary because it's like uh, the same state gets translated to the same, same position, by shifted by the same amount. If you start from different states, then it also gets shifted differently. So, uh, so, so, so that's basically the requirement for unitarity to hold. And as a unitary operator, every unitary operator has a Hermitian generator. And then the momentum is nothing but the Hermitian generator correspond to translation operation in the, in the space. And then uh, that's, that's the definition, but based on that definition, we can derive what the momentum operator looks like. 
in terms of the bracket notation, the momentum operator has a very abstract uh, uh, written. <laughs> but this is just to show you that, uh, again, the principle of quantum mechanics that every operator should be written as a linear combination of this bra and cat uh, <clears throat> basis operator. That, that still holds for momentum. But if you, want, you don't want to look at this, if you want just to understand how this momentum operator acts on a wave function in the position basis, then that's its action. It basically acts like a derivative operator on the wave function. So it's very interesting that uh, there are two expressions, one in terms of derivative, one in terms of integral. They are, all, they are both uh, describing the same operator, the momentum operator. Uh, maybe in calculus, you think that uh, integration and, uh, and, and differentiation is very different uh, operation. They are opposite to each other, but actually uh, uh, they can be unified. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that's the, that's the review of position and momentum operator. And then uh, today we are going to say that actually there is a very important algebraic relation between position and momentum, which is uh, this uh, commutation relation. And this commutation relation can be uh, understood uh, by just using this uh, uh, real space or position space representation. Just recall that the position operator will apply on a wave function psi of x, simply multiply this function by x. And the momentum operator acts as a differential operator. Maybe let me explain a little bit more why differentiation <laughs> has to do with translation. So suppose you have a function uh, psi of x which may look like this. And then what's its first order derivative? Partial x, psi of x, right? The first order derivative is, is calculating the slope. So the slope is, is negative here. So the slope is negative here. And then the slope is positive here, right? So the slope is positive. So this dashed line basically describes partial x, psi of x. Okay, so that's the dashed line. So what happens if we apply a momentum operator on the wave function is basically change the wave function to this shape. And what do we mean by momentum generates a translation? That means if we take psi of x and then we add that with uh, its first order derivative by a small amount, epsilon. So what happens is that if you add these two functions together, that's supposed to generate translation by the amount of epsilon. And that's indeed the case that uh, because this part because this, this, this is negative, so it becomes a little bit smaller uh, compared to the original function. And this, this slope actually becomes, gets higher, gets uh, pumped up. And here, because it's zero, so the peak doesn't change its uh, level. It remains at the same level, but gets shifted. So if you complete the whole function, uh, all the function is shifting uh, towards this direction, okay? Uh, of course, it depends on the plus or minus sign you define here. You can shift the function either to the left or to the right. But the point is that if you have a peak, and then if you try to shift the peak, what you need to do is you take this function and then uh, as add it with this uh, first order derivative. The derivative will automatically take care of all the slopes and then shift the function by, by what you want, basically. So that's the intuitive picture why translation, which doesn't seem to be anything to do with differentiation has such a close relationship with differentiation. So as the generator of translation, momentum operator really just acts as a partial derivative uh, with respect to the space x. So now if you want to understand its uh, commutation relation, the idea is just to apply these operators, commutator, on any function and probe and try to understand what happens to the function because commutation basically describes the amount of non-commutativity when you apply the operator in two different ways. So now suppose the uh, state is described by a wave function. Now I represent all the operator in terms of its operation on the wave function. So applying x and p in two different ways is like you first do xp and then px. So that means you can either apply to this wave function, first apply the partial derivative and then follow by multiply by x, or you first multiply the function by x and then apply the partial derivative to the whole thing <laughs> afterwards. But then, because this uh, derivative operator has this nice rule of, uh, it, it applies on the product of x and psi of x, it basically derivative into each 
each factors. So by uh, taking care of these expansions, you can show that the answer is just psi of x, which means it's like an identity operator acting on the state. Of course, there's still some uh, prefactor in the front, which is not that important. But the key point is that these two operators, they don't commute. The way that you first apply derivative and then multiply the function by x, or first multiply it by x and then apply derivative leads to different results. And then uh, the, re the difference of the result is nothing but the wave function itself. So, so that's why the commutator between x and p operator is simply this i h bar. h bar is the Planck constant times the identity operator. Okay, so this is the most important algebraic relation between x and p. You can even think that is the definition of uh, what uh, position and momentum should be. Uh, any questions? Okay, so that's what I want to talk about position and momentum operators. And then uh, uh, based on that, we can move on to the next topic, which is about harmonic oscillator. I believe you have already learned uh, harmonic oscillator many, many times. Uh, maybe uh, from classical mechanics to quantum A. But uh, uh, I think today I will take a different approach, which is basically using operator algebra. Previously, when you try to solve harmonic oscillator, I guess uh, uh, your professor tells you that you need to solve a differential equation, and there's something called Hermit polynomial, which is a solution of this wave function, which sounds very <laughs> terrible. So, uh, so in this course, uh, the point is that we will not solve any differential, op uh, differential equation. <laughs> the key point of the whole lesson lecture is that we will abandon all the differential equations. So uh, we will uh, try to understand things on the algebraic level. So that's why the title of this uh, part two is called Algebraic Method. So let's take a look at the harmonic oscillator, which is described by a Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian basically means the energy operator. So if you have a harmonic oscillator, it has two terms. There are two contributions to energy. One is the kinetic energy. The other is potential energy. Kinetic energy will be proportional to momentum squared. The, the higher momentum the particle has, the faster it moves, and then the higher uh, kinetic energy will be. And then the potential energy has to do with this uh, displacement. So uh, the further the particle is displaced from the origin, then uh, it experience a quadratic potential like that. So that's the standard, uh, standard uh, like a description of a uh, harmonic oscillator. But, uh, and there's uh, one thing beyond classical mechanics is that in classical mechanics, people don't care about position and momentum, whether they are operator, they just treat it as numbers. But in quantum mechanics, they're really operators, so operators don't commute. And then indeed, they don't commute. So there's also an important commutation relation. And in this expression, m stands for the part mass of the oscillator, and omega is the frequency of the oscillation. And then, uh, in order to simplify the problem a little bit, I don't want to take a look. <laughs> I don't want to deal with this m and omega every time. So, so let's try to rescale the position and momentum operator. So let's say, the, so uh, in the previous expression, whenever I see a p, I just replace by a p followed by uh, uh, this factor. Anyway, this is just a numerical factor. Uh, this is just some number, so I, I'm okay to just redefine my momentum and redefine my position operator by scaling it by a constant. Uh, the advantage of doing that is it makes the Hamiltonian looks very simple. The Hamiltonian now, after this rescaling, uh, let me show you the Hamiltonian before. <laughs> or, originally, the Hamiltonian contains a bunch of m and omega. I'm absorbing all these uh, nasty stuff into this uh, scaling. So after the scaling, the Hamiltonian has a universal uh, energy unit, h bar omega in the front. And after that, it is followed by p squared plus x squared. If you look at the previous Hamiltonian, it almost looked like p squared x squared is just the coefficient. It's not uh, unified, but now you can unify the coefficient. <clears throat> OK, so then we will basically be working with this new Hamiltonian. And because I have rescaled the position and momentum operator, I need to recompute the commutation relation, meaning that the commutation relation for these two p and x there. So if you redo that exercise, you will find that the commutation relation actually also gets simplified a little bit that the, uh, uh, this uh, Planck constant gets absorbed. Or you can say Planck constant has been set to 1 in some sense. 
So if you look at this Hamiltonian, first of all, there's an energy unit. So there's an energy scale. <laughs> all the energy is, uh, is basically uh, computed uh, in unit of h bar omega. And we will see that this will become a very important energy unit. And then the new position and momentum operator now becomes dimensionless, such that the commutation relation doesn't carry any Planck constant. It becomes a number, OK? So the commutation x and p is basically i. Imagine unit i times identity operator. Okay, so these are the two starting points of harmonic oscillator. And now our goal is trying to understand uh, the energy eigenstates and energy eigenvalue of these Hamiltonian. So the uh, so Hamiltonian is an operator. A Hermitian, as a Hermitian operator, it has uh, this uh, eigenspectrum. So we we want to understand that. <clears throat> But instead of trying to solve it directly, uh, let me first review what we have learned maybe previously. Uh, so the goal here is to find the eigen uh, spectrons. So this amounts to solving the so-called time-independent Schrodinger equation, which means that you are solving the eigen equation for this operator Hamiltonian. So that means there's a bunch of eigenstates which is labeled by n, where n is supposed to be the index of the uh, eigenstate. And then when the uh, Hamiltonian as an operator acting on n as a cat state, it basically as an eigenstate, right, uh, nothing happens. The states still remain the same. The only thing is that there's an eigenvalue multiplying the state as a consequence. So uh, the goal is to find those eigenstates and the corresponding eigenvalue. These eigenvalues are also called energy levels. It turns out that people have solved this problem. And then the energy uh, levels or the energy eigenvalues are labeled by this n, where n is an integer, non-negative integer, goes, going from 0, 1, 2, and so on, all the way to infinity. And then this uh, has ex an expression like that. So this uh, E of n, first of all, it has an overall energy scale, which is set by h bar omega. And then uh, following that, it's uh, something like an integer plus 1 half. So if you look at all these levels, uh, in terms of uh, uh, energy unit h bar omega, the energy level goes like 1 half, 3 half, 5 halves. If n equals 0, that the energy is like 1 half, right? And 0 is substitute 0 there. So if n equals 1, it's a 3 half, and so on. And then uh, apart from these energy levels or eigenvalues, there's also eigenstates in correspondence to the eigenvalues. So the eigenstates, well, I don't want to specify them. I just denoted them as 0, 1, 2, and so on. So there, there must be some states like that. And for now, let's not worry about what they look like. So the zero state, because it has the lowest energy among the, all the eigenstates, so it's, uh, so it's basically uh, said to be the ground state. Ground state means the lowest energy state in a, in a quantum mechanical system. And all the remaining states is called, uh, are called uh, excited states because they all have energy higher than the ground state. But then people develop a new idea, try to understand what these states mean. Because notice that the energy level spacing is equal between every two levels. For example, between 1 half and 3 half, it's differed by one unit of h bar omega, and then differed by another unit of h bar omega. Uh, the fact that the levels are equally spaced, meaning that this oscillator as a quantum mechanical system can only absorb or emit energy in integer units of h bar omega. Every time, it can only take in this amount of energy in integer units. So in order to understand this phenomenon, people imagine, it's only imagine for now, that uh, uh, every unit of energy is carried by some particle. Because it's, uh, the, the way that you are counting energy as a, uh, basically energy goes in proportional with uh, some integer n. And this integer n strongly suggests that it's counting the number of something. So in quantum mechanics, it's counting number of something, then the something will be called a particle. Basically, that's the definition of particle. Particle is basically an object that can carry energy. And then uh, because the particle always carry, the same particle always carry the same amount of energy or energy quantum, and then uh, that's why if you have more and more particle in the system, then your energy of the system will be higher and higher. And the way that the energy grows with the number of particles is indeed a constant times the particle number. So the idea is that maybe we can, uh, instead of thinking them as uh, oscillator, which has higher and higher energy, 
in classical pictures, an oscillator oscillates with a higher, higher energy means that its amplitude is higher, right? If it oscillates like this, uh, it's very low energy, but it's oscillating that, that wildly, it's higher energy. So that's the classical picture. But in quantum mechanics, there's a different picture that you can think that there's some fictitious particle that is trying to occupy this o uh, oscillator, and these particles called bosons. They are elementary excitations of the oscillator. And uh, it depends on the nature of the oscillator. Sometimes uh, the oscillator can be mechanical. Mechanical oscillator is like sound. Like if I knock the desk, then there's sound propagating in this solid. And this sound is, also, is kind of a wave. Wave is also an oscillation mode. And then that kind of a mode is will be called uh, phonons, which is a quanta of a sound, basically, a sound wave. And there's also light, right? Light coming down from the lights. And then uh, that's uh, photons, basically. The corresponding boson is called photon because light is actually an oscillating electromagnetic field. It's also an oscillator. So by saying oscillator, we, uh, we can mean many, many different things. But uh, all these different phenomena of oscillation in quantum mechanics are all related, uh, are all described by this simple harmonic oscillator kind of uh, <clears throat> model, and the fundamental concept is that the energy level is equally spaced, that uh, there is some emergent uh, particle which carries the energy, which we will, show, uh, we will see them later. So these bosons are uh, considered to be indistinguishable particle because each of them carry the same amount of energy, h bar omega, and there's no way to tell apart uh, how, this boson from that boson. Because you can think about this boson like the dollars you deposit in your bank, right? Today you deposit one dollar, <laughs> tomorrow you deposit another dollar. You can't go to the counter and say, please give me the dollar yesterday. <laughs> because there's no way to distinguish these uh, two dollars. That's, uh, that's what we mean by uh, indistinguishable particles. These particles only carry energy once they deposit into the system. They, add, they contribute to the total energy of the system, and there's no way to tell them apart. So uh, there is uh, two operators, which actually, uh, one operator is the deposing operator or creation operator, which creates boson in the system. The other is the annihilation operator, which takes a boson away out of the system. So the creation operator will take you from the zero, which corresponds to no boson state, to one boson, two boson, and so on. And then the other. So originally, this 0, 1, 2 was supposed to label the different energy levels of the harmonic oscillator, which may correspond to a higher and higher energy of the oscillation. But instead of thinking that, <coughs> you can also say 0 labels the 0 boson state. This labels 1 boson and 2 boson state, like that. So all this is just a motivation of how and why we should introduce this idea of bosons and creation and annihilation operators. But once we have this idea, it becomes uh, very interesting to study this uh, harmonic oscillator. It gives us some new intuitions about how particles can emerge in a quantum system which seems to have nothing to do with particle <laughs> at the very beginning. So in order to understand this harmonic oscillator better, we should introduce, uh, we should actually really define this annihilation and creation operator concretely. They are actually defined through the position and momentum operator. So the annihilation operator, by convention, uh, don't ask me why, but people just uh, create this convention. It's just uh, take it for now. And then uh, these two operators, one is x plus ip uh, divided by square root 2, this, the other x, uh, sorry, x, uh, yeah, the other x minus ip. So uh, the way to think of them is like uh, you are combining a uh, position and momentum operator as if they are the real part and imaginary part of a complex number. So this is the complex number. This is like a complex conjugate of that complex number. So, so that's why this operator is like a Hermitian conjugate of that operator, because we know that Hermitian conjugate simply is the operator version of complex conjugation. So x and p in, quantum, in classical mechanics X and P basically uh, correspond to something called a phase space. Uh, in classical mechanics, if you describe a state of a system, you can use its position and momentum. Uh, every, every particle has a definite position and a momentum, which is a point in the phase space. But in quantum mechanics, it's no longer possible to specify a point uh, to this uh, particle because position and momentum cannot be measured simultaneously uh, because of their non-trivial non commut commutation relation. So there's some fuzziness around this point. And then uh, th that's why people create some operator instead of using a number or a point or a coordinate to describe uh, the state of the system. 
But anyway, you can describe this uh, with, a, with, a, with a quantum operator, which is this A operator, which is like you are treating this two-dimensional phase space as a complex plane. Because we know a complex number is like uh, two real numbers. So you can always combine two real numbers into a complex number. And this A simply correspond to this complex number representation of the point in the phase space. Uh, and then it is also a quantum operator. It's no longer a number for now. And because it's a quantum operator, so it also may have some non-trivial commutation relation. Very specifically, it has a non-trivial commutation relation with its own Hermitian conjugate. And this non-trivial commu uh, commutation actually uh, uh, is derived from the commutation relation between X and P. So let me briefly explain this derivation that you basically need to take this uh, de definition of create, uh, uh, annihilation and creation operator and plug in into this commutation relationship, and then uh, you have something like that. And, uh, and the next step is to expand everything and then <laughs> expand out. There will be four different terms. Two of them will basically become zero, and then there's remaining two of them that is non-trivial. But these two of them, you can also organize them a little bit and then show that it eventually becomes XP commutator. And then given the fact that the XMP commutator is I times uh, identity operator, we have already rescaled these uh, position and momentum operators so, such that it becomes I times identity. But anyway, in the end, it's just one. It's just identity operator. So just following this very simple uh, uh, derivation, you can show that uh, there is a, a commutation relation between A and a dagger, a and a dagger, if they are defined as as defined above, yeah, <clears throat> okay. But uh, this commutation relation maybe still looks uh, very abstract. Uh, the the concrete meaning of this commutation relation actually is uh, described by these two lines. These two lines are nothing but just write down this commutation, expand this commutation relation just uh, uh, explicitly, because on the left hand side what we have is a a dagger minus a dagger a. So you can, so a a dagger is this term. Minus a dagger a, doesn't matter, we move that a dagger a to the other side of the equation, right? So what does that mean? That means a a dagger, if you try to switch a dagger to the left hand side of a, try to exchange the position of these two operators, the order of these two operators, what you get is you will get additional plus identity operator uh, behind. And then if you try to switch it back, so for example, you start from a dagger, a, you try to move this a dagger backwards, then you will have to subtract this expression by another identity operator. So these two uh, equations basically tells us how to interchange a and a dagger, uh, the order of these two operators, when they, when they are multiplied together. So these are the very important algebraic relations between commutation and annihilation operator. So what about if I want to exchange two annihilation operators, <laughs> for example, A and A? You can also try to check that the commutation relation between A and itself is, tri is trivial, right? Because uh, that's a fundamental property. Any operator, regardless of its nature, it always commutes with itself. Because commutation is basically saying that if you apply A twice, right, it shouldn't matter which A you apply first. So. <clears throat> So this uh, commutation relation vanishes between two annihilation operator or between two creation operator. We only have a non-trivial commutation relation between the annihilation and the creation operator. And the meaning of that is that whenever you try to commute a creation operator through annihilation operator or vice versa, you need to take care of this additional plus or minus identity operator. And then uh, given that property, uh, we can continue to uh, study its algebraic relation. Any question at this point? Okay, so it's all definition, but uh, for now, let's just take it. And we will see magic will happen later <laughs> based on this algebraic definition. And because this, we, we have just introduced the concept of boson, and then it's very, um, <clears throat> uh, it's very good to define, actually, a new operator, which actually, in the end, will relate to the boson number operator, which counts the number of bosons. But for now, uh, it's unclear why we need to define this operator. And it's unclear that it has anything to do with the boson number. But anyway, we just define it. <laughs> so, uh, so it's called the number operator. And then the name will be evident later. <laughs> and then the number operator is just defined as a dagger times a. It's just uh, first apply the annihilation operator and then apply the creation operator. 
uh, it's like uh, magically <laughs> you have a basket of uh, apples and then you first apply annihilation operator take an apple out of the basket and then put it back into the basket and usually you think that that's nothing right <laughs> you have the same number of uh, apples but magically for boson system it counts how many apples are there in the basket so that's the that's the magic uh, operator and we will see that later why uh, it has this uh, kind of uh, operate uh, kind of this kind of uh, action but anyway, given the, uh, uh, the definition of this number operator, uh, we can actually show that it's related to the position and momentum operator in this way. Uh, the, the way to show is, it's also, it's also not difficult. You just need to substitute the definition of uh, A dagger and A into this, uh, for example, this definition, right? And then uh, on the right-hand side, orig originally is creation and annihilation operator. You expand everything and simplify, simplify in the end. You will, uh, you will basically end up with this result. And this, this is the result that I show uh, above. <clears throat> Okay, but remember that previously we say that the Hamiltonian basically is also expressed as a Hamiltonian operator is like a, a one half h bar omega times p squared plus x squared. This part is the Hamiltonian operator almost like that. So that's why the Hamiltonian operator can also be written in terms of this newly defined number operator in this way. So this already looks very much like the final answer. We are actually approaching that. So now, in all the, because our previous goal was to find the eigenvalues and eigenstate of the Hamiltonian operator, but now given the fact that the Hamiltonian operator is simply related to this number operator, although we don't know why it is number, but anyway, it's some A dagger A operator, because, it's, uh, because of this relation, instead of trying to understand what's the eigenstate of this H, we can also say we, we just want to understand what's the eigenstate of this N operator. Because once we have that knowledge, suppose we can find the eigenvalue, which is denoted as N, and the eigenstate, which is denoted as a cat of N, of this operator uh, N hat, which means that N hat operator acting on its eigenstates uh, basically give you the eigenstates multiply the eigenvalue. So if we know what are these eigenstates and eigenvalue of the N operator, automatically the same set of eigenstates will become the eigenstate of Hamiltonian. Because the, by saying that this is an eigenstate of N operator, which means that N operator acting on the state just multiply the states by whatever eigenvalue uh, we have. So now if you apply the Hamiltonian operator on the eigenstate of this N operator, what happens is that this operator N hat will simply be replaced by a number which corresponds to the eigenvalue N here. And what about this identity operator? Identity operator acting on any state is just one times that state. So identity operator will be replaced by one, but there's a one half, so, so one half. So immediately everything becomes an operator acting on the state to give you a number, no matter how complicated this number is, but it's a number <laughs> multiplying the state. And that number, you have no other choice but to define it as the eigenenergy of this Hamiltonian. So uh, if, you, if we want to understand what are the eigenstate and eigenlevel of this harmonic oscillator's Hamiltonian, all we need to know is to understand the eigenspectrum is of this newly defined N operator, number operator. Once we have done that, we will be able to show that the uh, energy level will, looks like that. So what is left behind to be understood is why these eigenenergy, eigenvalues, of this N operator are quantized, are discrete integers. Because uh, from this expression, there's nowhere we can in indicate that this N is an integer, right? And then uh, or another more, uh, uh, one step further question is like, what are the eigenstates? Of course, we, 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 we don't just want to understand eigenvalue, we also want to understand the property of the eigenstates. So for example, what is the interrelationship between these uh, states under the creation and uh, action of creation and annihilation operator. How does creation and annihilation operator connect different eigenstates by creating particles in these uh, eigenstates? Okay, so that, that are the two questions we wish to uh, answer in the following. And in order to answer this question that's uh, basically summarized, that all we have done so far is we have defined a creation and annihilation operator, A dagger and A. And we multiply, of course, that defined from the position and momentum operator, but once defined, we can forget about position and momentum operator and work with this A dagger and A. 
with this A dagger in A, you can also define the number operator, which is the uh, A dagger A, basically. And then uh, uh, previously, we say that you can actually try to understand how to commute things through each other. For example, uh, uh, for example, you can derive equation 47. The way to define equation 47 is like this. Uh, let me just show you one, uh, one derivation. Uh, previously, we want to understand how to commute A daggers, A through A dagger. But now you can also try to figure out how to commute A through this N operator. Because in the end, this N operator, number operator, is just made of A dagger and A. So there's no fundamental difference. You just need to apply those rules multiple times. So for example, I start from a N times A operator. But the N operator is nothing but A dagger A by definition. And then now I try to move this A operator all the way through the N operator. I wish that this A uh, annihilation operator can appear on the other hand side, on, on here in the front. So what I need to do is I basically need to move this A, that A operator through this A operator, but nothing changed because they are the same operator. <laughs> but now I want to move this A operator through this A dagger. OK, something non-trivial happened. Once you take this annihilation through the creation, commuting through that, and according to the formula we derived previously, it becomes A and A dagger minus identity. There's a minus identity. Now you expand everything, it becomes this uh, expression. But now you can see A dagger A appears again, right? So this A dagger A combined into the number operator again. And then you can see there's an overall factor of A operator. You can factor out. And then what happens is that it becomes n minus 1, basically, of A. So what happens is that if you take A through the n operator, a operator doesn't change, but n operator gets uh, minors by identity. So that's the rule. And then uh, following the same derivation, uh, similar spirit, you can show that if you take a dagger through n, then what happens is a dagger just goes through uh, this uh, n, but n gets uh, added by 1, basically. So that's the algebraic relation between uh, a dagger and a. So. This is pretty much like uh, when you do Photoshop, you can, <laughs> there's a line. You can drag the lines through the picture <laughs> and then <laughs> apply certain filter to the picture. <laughs> so, so this A is a line which actually decreases the brightness by one. <laughs> so you, you drag A through a picture, and then that picture brightness gets minus one. <laughs> and then if you drag A dagger <laughs> through the picture, and then it's a number, or through the number operator, the number operator gets uh, increased by one. Okay, so, uh, so that's, uh, that's the property of these uh, operators. But that's still not enough uh, to give up all the conclusions yet, because we need to go a, one more step further. Now if we consider an operator function, which is, a, which is a combination, like a polynomial combination of all these n to any power, so it looks like that. And we want to show that actually if you if you drag this A operator through this function, what happens is that every N operator inside this function uh, will, get, uh, will get replaced by N minus 1. And after you, you push this A operator through this function, and there are two things that is going to happen. One is N operator gets minus 1. The other is this A operator will now meet or C, this A dagger operator, they will combine on this left-hand side into the, an, another new N operator. So this equation basically tells us if I have whatever complicated function of N, what happens if you sandwich them between A dagger and A, the consequence is just you just need to re-evaluate this function on a new uh, particle number, which corresponds to n minus 1, and then multiply the result by a new uh, n operator. So that, is, that basically follows the algebraic properties that we derived previously. The reason that this applies to any function, because any function looks like a linear combination of these polynomials. So if you drag a through this function, then <coughs> Every term, basically, it applies to every term. So for example, uh, if you drag it through the, this term, uh, this n will become n minus 1. If you drag it through this term, you can drag it through this term basically in steps, right? Because this n square is basically n times n. If you want to now push uh, a through this n times n, you push it through the first n, and then the second n, both n gets uh, 
uh, transform into n minus one. And then so, so because every term in this function, as long as it contains a n operator, n operator will anyway be replaced by n minus one. As long as you push this a operator through the n operator, then, uh, then the whole function just transform in this way. Okay, uh, this, yes? Uh, square is anything, it's a placeholder, it's an empty space, whatever <laughs> things. I, I'm trying to say that if you have any function and then if you transform the function by this kind of transformation, meaning that you, re you replace the function <laughs> stacked operator in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, sorry for that. Uh, but uh, this, is, this is the most important final algebraic relation that I want to derive. Uh, you can see where we come from. We start from the commutation relation between position and momentum. We define the creation and annihilation operator. We find out its commuta their commutation relations. And we also define the number operator. We also find out the commutation relation between the creation and annihilation and the number operators. And then we come up with a conclusion that uh, there is an interesting relation that if you, <laughs> if you sandwich any function of number operator between A dagger and A, what happens if you, get, you can get rid of A dagger and A and leave it, uh, and, and basically that leaves you with a pure expression of this function. But this equation is very powerful because it leads to a sequence of uh, uh, recursion relations. So we have already defined A dagger and A equals the number operator. You may ask, what is A dagger square and then A square, right? I, uh, I don't need to multiply A dagger and A together. I can, I can do it twice. I can do, it, uh, do the annihilation twice. I take two apples out of my basket and then put two apples back into my basket. What will happen? Well, in that case, you will not only count the number of particles, you will count some something more uh, complicated. The, re the, the, way to, uh, the way to derive this is you can think that this, <coughs> this expression is simply the first line followed by a, a dagger, additional layer, additional layer of a dagger on the left and a on the right, right? So this formula tells you how to take away this a dagger and a from both sides, from the left-hand side and right-hand side simultaneously. What you need to do is you take whatever function inside, which is this one, now it's n. Now you replace every n by n minus one, which goes to here, and then in the front, multiply another new n, so that goes to here. So that's why this a dagger twice and a twice, this, uh, this expression equals to this new uh, expression in terms of the number operator. For the same reason, you can go to the, uh, another new order, which is a to the third power, and uh, sorry, a dagger, <laughs> creation three times, annihilation three times. So <clears throat> if you consider this operator, you can again take away the outmost uh, a dagger and A. But then you start from here, you, you, you basically replace every number operator in this expression by n minus one. So this term goes to here, this term goes to here, but uh, don't forget that there is another n operator need to be multiplied in the front. So uh, this expression goes like this. But if you look at all these lines, what happens is all lines starts with an n. But then it starts to multiply this n with either n minus one or n minus one and then n minus two. And then you can imagine that if I do a dagger to the fourth power, it will be, become n times n minus one times n minus two and then times n minus three, right? So, uh, so that's imaginable. So, so from that, we conclude that if you do this uh, a dagger and a operator to the nth power, m correspond to this one or two or three and so on, it basically corresponds to n minus something all multiplied together and this something goes from zero to n minus, m minus one. For example, if m equals one, then this expression l equals zero basically, so uh, a dagger a is n. If m equals two, then there are two terms that need to be multiplied here. One is l equals zero, the other is l equals one, so that is n times n minus one and so on. That's all I want to say. So uh, with such an effort, we have finally reached uh, the most useful uh, expression that we will immediately use down there. That is, if you, uh, if you annihilate uh, the harmonic oscillators boson by m times, and then create by m times, that uh, results correspond to a new operator which can be fully written in terms of the number operator uh, using such a multiplication. It's in a product form like this. 
this. This product is a product of operators. OK? Any questions? Uh, it's all derivation. But, uh, but then, uh, given this derivation, I'm not sure I can finish that, but uh, let me start uh, describing what I want to do. Uh, so so all, all I was talking about is algebraics. And then uh, how is these algebras, which seems very complicated, has any relation to physics? Because our final goal is still to try to understand, uh, for example, what can be the eigenvalues of these uh, N operators. But it turns out there is a simple uh, principle uh, that allows us to compute this eigenvalue without solving any differential equation or without diagonalizing any matrix. This method is called the quantum bootstrap. Bootstrap is an action which you take your boots and then <laughs> lift yourself up. So bootstrap, the idea of bootstrap is you need to know nothing and then just by looking at this algebraic relation automatically gives you uh, a constraints of your quantum system. And by solving those constraints, you already can solve the whole problem already. So this is very powerful. And the most important constraint in quantum bootstrap <coughs> is called the positivity constraint. This constraint is very simple, the principle. It's saying that the scalar product between any uh, state vectors and itself must be non-negative. That is obvious, because that's just norm of the state vector. And the norm of the state vector is summing over <laughs> norm square of every component of the state vector, right? Uh, if it applies to wave function, it's also the same thing. You take the wave function and absolute value and square and then integrate over the whole real domain. So that's, the, that's basically the norm of the uh, wave function. So that must be a non-negative number because norm square is non-negative. You integrate them over, it's not going to give you any negative contribution. So the fact that any state vector, no matter where you get them from, uh, you must have this scalar product greater or equal than zero. Uh, that's, let us see how this very simple enough principle is powerful enough to establish the full energy spectrum and eigenstate of a harmonic oscillator, which is, I think is amazing. It's like a, such a simple principle was able to determine the eigenspectrum. Uh, because this is an inequality, that means no matter this, uh, uh, we, we will see that soon. So suppose we start from an uh, assumption that this n operator has an eigenstate labeled by n and has a corresponding eigenvalue of n. At this point, we make no assumption that this eigenvalue is an integer. So they are just eigenvalue. They are supposed to be real number because eigenvalues of Hermitian operator at least need to be real. But other than that, there's no further assumption. But now we can take any operator O. This O doesn't need to be creation or annihilation. can be multiple times of creation and annihilation. And any, any operator, or even number operator, you can take any operator acting on this N. This will generally produce a new state, right? This is a state. This is an operator. Operator acting on state gives you a new state, which calls psi. But as a generic state, it must satisfy the positivity constraint, meaning that this operator acting on this state, this, this is psi. This is psi, uh, this is, uh, psi trans, like a conjugate, Hermitian conjugate, right? This is a cat psi, this is bra psi. We know bra and cat state are related by flipping the cat state to the bra state and also flipping all the operator to its Hermitian conjugate. So that means for any operator, if you try to compute O dagger O, try to take this operator and calculate its expectation value on the eigenstate, which is, uh, which is labeled by this N, it must be some number that is greater or equal than zero. So the idea is that you can try to go to here and then express this, take this expression and express it in terms of N. And then this will give you a lot of uh, inequalities about this number N, which is supposed to be a real number. And then these inequalities was able, by solving them, you are able to de determine what are the possible values of uh, N. So basically, we are going to apply this method to, uh, two, 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 <laughs> two minutes, OK. Um, I'll talk about it again next time. So, so but, but simply, uh, the idea is you put this O as A to the nth power, and then you plug that in. And then based on what we have just derived, this A to the nth power and A dagger to the nth power and A to the nth power gives you an expression which is written in terms of this N operator. But if you evaluate this expression on the eigenstate, nothing happens, but you just replace every operator by its eigenvalue, so that goes to here. 
And then next time we will try to solve this equation and show that this n is actually an integer. And thank you for it. <laughs>